All right. Today's uh, episode is part of the Stop Pedophilia series, um, particularly talking about the Pottinger supremacy, the road to the takedown of Jeffrey Epstein, part three. Uh, this is an article by Johnny Vedmore of newspaste.com. And there's a QR code symbol there on the screen if you want to uh, go jump to the article. So here we go. We'll uh, get uh, over here. The Pottinger Supremacy, the Road to the Takedown of Jeffrey Epstein. I'm testing out this new uh, scrolling feature here. It's not working so well. Just a moment to get this realigned. Stanley Pottinger played a central role in signing off Watergate, the Kent State Massacre, and the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. But as his time at the Justice Department came to an end, he also helped his good friend and CIA director, George H.W. Bush, in other ways. However, Bush was not Pottinger's only connection to the world of intelligence during this period. He was also busy smuggling arms with Jeffrey Epstein himself. Welcome to the Pottinger Supremacy. Pottinger had been the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice from 1973, eventually standing down in 1977, where he became classified as a special assistant to the Attorney General for a brief period later that same year. In that position, Pottinger was allowed to stay on under the Carter administration to finish his official investigation into the Watergate stand scandal. During the years which were to follow, Pottinger first worked as an attorney on behalf of very large companies, as well as some other rather sinister individuals before going into banking soon after. However, during this period of Pottinger's life, his association with a certain three-letter U.S. intelligence agency becomes unbearably obvious. As J. Stanley Pottinger left government service, his, mention, he, his mentions in the annals of history decrease. He was no longer the public face of an influential government department. Instead, he moved on to join a reformed private legal practice, which was still finding its feet. On the 5th of August, 1975, Troy, Malin, and Loveland had been formed and was originally registered at 324 Datura Street, West Palm Beach, Florida. The named directors of the legal firm, Joseph F. Troy, Ronald H. Malin, and Joseph A. Loveland, Jr., didn't start by practicing law in Florida. They all had been based in Los Angeles, California, and that is where the practice had originally begun to see clients. Within a couple of years, Loveland, Jr. became a director vice president and general counsel for the hotel chain Ramada Inns, later going on to manage other successful enterprises. And in 1978, his old legal firm was being reformed into Troy, Malin, and Pottinger. In 1978, the State Bar Annual Report of TMP listed 10 shareholders as part of the law firm. But the following year, TMP only registered two stakeholders, Troy and Malin, leading to an eventual court case in 1984 to establish who actually owned shares in the firm. King of Compliance. The Bank Secrecy Act, BSA, also referred to as the Currency and Foreign Transactions Reporting Act, was passed by the U.S. Congress on the 26th of October, 1970. The act had been successfully pushed forward due to the efforts of Representative Wright Patman, a Democrat of Texas, 
who in the early 70s was the chairman of the House Banking and Currency Committee. The law required financial institutions in the U.S. to assist American government agencies in their efforts to detect and prevent money laundering. In July of 1972, after an eight-month delay, the Treasury Department officially put the BSA-related regulations into the Federal Register, which enabled the law to take effect. However, by the 1980s, many institutions hadn't changed their behavior, with various groups claiming that the act violated Fourth Amendment rights protecting against unwarranted search and seizure among along with Fifth Amendment rights protecting due process. In 1977, the Treasury Department was pushed into action on enforcing the measures within the banking sector, and the following year they were reported ready to take action. In a New York Times article dated the 23rd of January, 1978, entitled U.S. After Lapse is Enforcing Bank Secrecy Act announced the action being taken against various organizations, stating the Treasury, which last year fined Gulf Oil $229,500 for failing to report money it brought into the United States, is expected to bring further actions against other corporate violators, including Lockheed and Phillips, according to congressional sources. The article written by Jeff Gerth noted the recent troubles experienced by, among others, Chemical Bank, which in 1977 had been indicted on 445 counts of failure to report $8.5 million in cash, which they had moved into the U.S. Gerth writes that many banks were also guilty of moving cash which involved laundered funds of suspected narcotics traffickers. To tackle the growth, growing risk of more serious indictments, companies such as Chemical Bank were looking for a legal representative who had significant and confirmed influence within government. The latter article also states, Chemical Bank, in the wake of its indictment last year, instituted substantive changes in its operations. The bank, sixth largest in the nation, strengthened its auditing and compliance division and hired two former Justice Department officials, Harold R. Tyler Jr., former Deputy Attorney General, and Stanley Pottinger, former Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Civil Rights Division. In an independent inquiry, the two men detailed various weaknesses in the bank's monitoring and reporting techniques. As a result, the bank adopted new, tighter procedures. Pottinger was highly sought after once he left the White House. And in expanding his horizons, it wasn't only Chemical Bank which enticed Pottinger to represent them. After all, as advances in communication technology increased exponentially, so did the risk of negative public exposure with the potential to cause a scandal for any famous brand. This gave large corporations the impetus to revitalize their public image by creating highly skilled integrity checkers to examine their company's procedures for any potential significant issues. By early 1978, Pottinger had seen a growing gap in the market. The Atlanta Constitution reported on the 7th of May, 1978, that once one government source who had been closely tracking the usurpage in so-called corporate integrity investigations estimates that fully one-fourth of the nation's Fortune 500 businesses have hired outside law firms or financial detectives in an effort to rid themselves of everything from dishonest executives to infiltration by organized crime. The article goes on to say, recently, for example, J. Stanley Pottinger, Pottinger, former head of the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division, 
formed one such company in Washington with John Olszewski, the hard-nosed former head of the Intelligence Division of the Internal Revenue Service. When Pottinger's law firm is hired to probe a large corporation, he simply contracts with his own company to do the actual investigative legwork. Pottinger had created a company with a former intelligence chief offering large corporations internal investigations that could potentially reveal awkward revelations and prevent public exposure. This seemed to be where Pottinger shone the most. While in public office, he had been the go-to guy for when the government needed to investigate themselves and keep any potential revelations from becoming common knowledge. In relation to the Kent State shootings, Watergate, and the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., Pottinger had not only spearheaded the investigations, he had also been responsible for the cover, the official cover-ups. In 1979, Pottinger's law firm, Troy, Malin, and Pottinger, were being hired to represent some of the biggest companies in the U.S. The Mead Corporation were soon to hire Pottinger and his associates for their battle against Dr. Armand Hammer's Occidental Petroleum. The latter was attempting to acquire Mead Corporation, and an Ohio-based forest products company, which had turned to Pottinger and his legal partners to fight off an attempted takeover by Occidental. Troy, Mallon, and Pottinger's involvement in the case had a devastating impact on Occidental's attempted acquisition, forcing Hammer's company to release a mass of damaging information during a five-month takeover struggle. An article by Judith Miller, published in the New York Times, stated, Mead's anti-merger strategy, according to lawyers on the case, depended on either winning the antitrust actions or uncovering enough unfavorable information about Occidental's business practices to force it to withdraw. To do the digging, Mead hired Troy Malin and Pottinger, a firm with Washington and Los Angeles offices that specializes in com uh, combining litigation and investigatory skills. Lawyers for the firm declined to discuss the case. However, it was this firm, according to sources close to the case, that uncovered Dr. Hammer's practice of soliciting undated resig resignation letters, a practice that raises questions about whether the Occidental Board was able to carry out its salutary, uh, its statutory mandate to provide an independent check on management. By the time Pottinger and company deposed Occidental financial consultant, Maury P. Leibovitz, Meade had won their freedom. Within a week of Pottinger's aggressive questioning of Leibovitz, Occidental Petroleum abandoned their lengthy and pricey takeover attempt. Jay Stanley Pottinger had left his post in the Justice Department and wasn't finding it difficult to gain work from por corporate giants. However, during this period, Pottinger was also involved in the business of treason. Pottinger's central role in the Iran-Contra scandal, illegal arms smuggling, and the October surprise. Pottinger's connections to the U.S. intelligence agencies had become glaringly obvious by the start of the 1980s. In office, he had helped cover up various brazen crimes committed by three-letter American intelligence agencies. During this period, Pottinger had also teamed up with a former intelligence head from the Internal Revenue Service, but it is his many connections to the CIA which really stand out. As previously mentioned, in part one of this series, the Pottinger identity, J. Stanley Pottinger, 
had made sure George H.W. Bush's CIA had gained the authority to begin limited domestic surveillance activities after the assassination of Orlando Letier. But Pottinger was doing a lot more behind the scenes and he was being watched. To an outside observer, Pottinger appeared to be involved with his own political ambitions during 1980, running unsuccessfully as a Republican candidate in Baltimore's, um, hang on a second, I lost my place. In Baltimore's, Baltimore's 8th District of Bethesda. He was also giving public donations to political candidates during the 1980 election, presidential election campaign, including contributions of $1,000 to Edward M. Kennedy's campaign, as well as $250 to the campaign of George H.W. Bush. If it wasn't his own political ambitions, which saw Pottinger make the newspapers in 1980, it was his relationship with the infamous feminist Gloria Steinem. Steinem who had also had many links to the CIA by this period, reportedly helped Pottinger decorate his new house on Helmsdale Road in Bethesda. The interior decorated employed by Pottinger for this task was a contractor named Shelley Grant Gambler, who failed to complete the work. With Gambler's business declaring bankruptcy soon after taking the contract and leaving Pottinger as one of several creditors. Pottinger requested that his case against Gambler should take precedence over the other creditors in the bankruptcy case because he claimed Gambler had defrauded him. The case was unusually hand, handed over to the U.S. Attorney General uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, so that they could examine the agreement. It found guilty of fraud, Gambler, if found guilty of fraud, Gambler was facing five years in prison and a $5,000 fine. However, in return for Pottinger dropping the case, Gambler offered him a $5,000 promissory note, which Pottinger accepted. Pottinger dropped his case against Gambler, but claimed that his decision not to continue with the claim was, was nothing to do with the promise of $5,000 he had received from Gambler. Throughout 1979, Pottinger had be become a veritable man about town, often seen at the trendiest clubs, hanging off of the arm of his girlfriend, Steinem. Pottinger was still to represent big clients in 1980 with a court case against the under fire found of f under fire founder of Space Research Corp Gerald V Bull dragging Pottinger into the limelight again Bull was being reported as a broken man after he was convicted of illegally dealing arms to the South African apartheid regime in jail Bull was diagnosed as suicidal, and he was put under round-the-clock psychiatric care, which saw Pottinger successfully argue for one, for a one-month delay in his client's trial. Pottinger originally pushed for a reduction on the suspension in his client's sentence, but the evidence was enough to see the beleaguered Bull heading towards a trial. Bull had originally been charged in Canada for conspiring to send to send arms illegally to South Africa, but that case was soon after settled with a settlement which stipulated that Bull couldn't be indicted. However, on the other side of the border, Gerald Bull wasn't going to find any such leniency. The day after a settlement, had been announced in Canada relating to the illegal shipment of ultra-long-ranged artillery shells and other equipment to South Africa, the Green Bay Press Gazette was reporting that federal officials were still investigating the case. Attorney General Benjamin uh, Civiletti was in charge of the probe 
which saw both SRC's president, Gerald V. Bull, and its chief operations officer, Rogers L. Gregory, plead guilty. Gerald Bull's Space Research Corporation, SRC, had originally gained its funding after the U.S. and Canadian federal governments cut the budget related to his involvement in Project HARP, H-A-R-P, High Altitude Research Project. The joint governments gave the remainder of HARP's assets to Bull's newly formed SRC, Space Research Corporation, in order to develop and commercialize the technology needed for su superior long-ranged artillery. Space Research Corporation's client list contained various nations which were swamped with controversy with the authoritarian governments of China, Chile, South Africa being among their main customers. Bull had also supposedly been bolstered by CIA support for some of his projects. South Africa was seen by the U.S. intelligence agency as a potential bastion against the Soviet infiltration of Angola, with the CIA even being rumored to have successfully persuaded South Africa to invade Angola at the start of their civil war in 1975. It was after the UN mandatory arms embargo prohibiting the export of arms to South Africa was introduced in 1977 that Bull again rumored to be encouraged by the CIA supplied the apartheid regime with gun barrels and 30,000 shells which cost more than $30 million. The shipment of arms was delivered on the MV um, Tugaland, I'm not saying that right, Tugeland, Tugeland, with the co cooperation of Israeli military industries. Gerald Bull was eventually murdered in 1990. It is believed that his death was at the hands of the Mossad. During this period, the U.S. Embassy in Iran had been the center of the news since the 4th of November, 1979, when pro Khomeini demonstrations turned protests into a siege of the embassy itself. What ensued now, referred to as the Iran hostage crisis, did not end for 444 days, finally finishing on the 20th of January, 1981. U.S. Embassy hostage situation in Tehran had made public diplomatic options between Iran and America limited. On the 7th of December, 1979, J. Stanley Pottinger wrote to Warren Christopher, who was then Deputy Secretary of State. The letter was on behalf of Cyrus Hashimi, Pottinger's client at the time, and contained a memorandum from Hashimi which stated the issue, the issues he believed Iran was most concerned about. The letter also suggested that Hashimi was in frequent contact with various important players within the Iranian government and that he would be happy to become a conduit to help end the crisis via secretive dis diplomacy. Hashimi had been busy. He had made contact with Ramsey Clark, who was a former attorney general and was teaching courses at Howard University School of Law, as well as being an associate of New York law firm, Paul, Paul Weiss, Rifkind, Wharton, and Garrison. <laughs> Clark had been told by Hashimi that he was hopeful of arranging a meeting between Khomeini's nephew and a U.S. representative. Ramsey Clark informed Harold Saunders, who was uh, heading up the Iran Working Group, IWG, which had been set up by the State Department specifically to monitor the situation. On the 12th of December, 1979, Saunders met Hashimi in Pottinger's office, where the Iranian recommendation, uh, recommended that 
the U.S. developed channels of communication with people such as himself, claiming he had no particular political ambition, while also suggesting that the U.S. representative chosen could also meet with Ayatollah Pasendedit. Sorry, Pasendida. Pasendida. Admiral Medani, who was a high ranking member of Iran, Iran's armed forces, or an Iranian economist named Dr. Mah Mahoud. Mah Mahoud. Moin. Hashimi pushed his agenda, agenda but the I. WG soon concluded that Hashimi's may be serving his own personal interests, making a note that Hashimi might be seeking to avoid lawsuits. As Cyrus Hashimi's proposals work their way up to the, up the political food chain, there was still much skepticism. However, the Secretary of State at the time under Jimmy Carter, Cyrus Vance, shelved his own uh, doubts and recommended secret exploration of Hashimi's proposals. On January 2nd, 1980, Saunders again met with Pottinger and Hashimi, but this time Dr. Moyne was, Moyne was present as a representative of Khomeini's nephew. Alongside them was Cyrus's Cyrus Hashimi's stepbrother, Mohammed Ali Balamayan Hashimi, commonly referred to as Jamshid, but who also used various false identities, which included being called Abdullah Hashimi, Jashmid uh, Kalaj, and Jashmid Parsa. Jajmid Hashimi offered to establish a direct line of contact to Ayatollah's Pasadide Pasadide and Khomeini so long as to help resolve the hostage crisis. The Hashimis, along with Saunders, soon met with the chief of the CIA's Near East Division, Charles Kogan, on the 5th of January, 1980. At this meeting, the Hashimi brothers also claimed to be representing Admiral Ahmed Mandani, who was running for president of Iran. Jajmid Hashimi explained that he was fully mandated by Mandini to seek election campaign funds from the Americans. The Hashimis were offering something which the CIA craved, access to a potential future leader of Iran. Admiral Mandani and the agency saw the Hashemi brothers as the key to forging this secret alliance. As often happens with the CIA, what began as a diplomatic channels opened to resolve a crisis soon became a potential opportunity to enact an American-aligned military coup. Hashimi promised Kogan that if the Pasen did dead med mediation efforts resulted in failure, and if Mandani was not elected president, the hostages would be freed by the military action Mandani would take to overthrow the current regime. Kogan gave the Hashimis $500,000, saying that there were no strings attached, but required an accounting of how the funds were spent and stipulated that the hostages had to be returned unharmed. Kogan attempted to deliver them the cash on the 17th of January, 1980, to the same New York hotel in which their original meeting had been held but the Hashimis refused to accept the cash and instead insisted on wire transfer. The money was to be moved from a Swiss bank account to an account in London. 
However, by the 7th of February, 1980, CIA officials had determined that Jamshid Hashimi was a trafficker in intelligence to whomever would buy it and was dishonest and untrustworthy beyond belief. They also accused Jamshid Hashimi of exaggerating his contacts with Mindani and accused both the Hashimi brothers of holding back 90% of the funds meant for the presidential campaign. The CIA demanded that the brothers give a full accounting of how the funds were used and terminated their relationship. Medani lost the election and Kogan estimated that the $100,000 had been used for the operation. Uh, the Hashimis returned $290,000 of the funds in the form of a check, which they delivered to the private offices in Washington of Stanley of J. Stanley Pottinger. By late February 1980, the CIA had completely cut off contact with the Hashimis, but their investigations had also uncovered substantial information about the fraudulent business dealings by the brothers. Even though the CIA had concluded that the Hashimis were unreliable, mainly due to their behavior, the behavior of Jamshid Hashimi, his brother Cyrus was not intending to give up. In late February, Cyrus Hashimi reported to the State Department that Reza Pesen did it was to meet with him and Pottinger in Europe. Saunders briefed Pottinger with just enough to give him some innocent but cogent questions, which could help determine whether or not a meeting with Passendidier would, be, would truly be beneficial. The meeting eventually happened in Madrid on the 2nd of July, 1980, with Hashimi Passen. Headed Moini and Pottinger gathering at the Hilton Hotel. Pesendide told them he was there because key people around Khomeini wanted to end the crisis. The Office of the Historian holds a number of documents concerning the Iranian hostage crisis. One of them, entitled 310 dot memorandum from Secretary of State Muskie to President Carter, which is dated the 3rd of Wednesday, July 1980, states, We have just received a report of a meeting yesterday in Madrid between Khomeini's nephew Reza Pasadede, the son of Khomeini's older brother, and Washington attorney Stan Pottinger. The meeting was arranged at Pasadena's request, according to Pottinger. Pasadena claimed to be acting as Bani Sadar's emissary. He stated that Bani Sadar was now interested in beginning talks in Europe between his representative and a U.S. representative to discuss a possible settlement, including release of the hostages. However, it appears that the negotiations which took place in Madrid were not seen by the Iranians who were present as involving representatives of the sitting political leader of the U.S. President, Jimmy Carter. Instead, Pasadena eventually told Abdul Hassan Bani Sadar that he was meeting Mr. Reagan's envoys. Bin Sadar later gave testimony to the October Surprise Tax Task Force about the affair, which went on to be recorded in 1993 during the so-called joint report of the task force to investigate certain allegations concerning the holding of American hostages by Iran in 1980. Question. Well, did Mr. Pasadena tell you, Mr. President, who he had met? Answer. So I said, who are these Americans? And he said it was Mr. Reagan's envoys. Question. So Mr. Pasadena believed that the people that he was meeting were people that Reagan had sent? 
Answer, yes, quite, because he told me that if the deal is not made with you, then they'll make the deal with your rivals. And with Mr. Carter, they were already in contact. They had three different channels of communication with President Carter. Those two French lawyers, the Swiss ambassador, the German ambassador. So it wasn't worth talking about that with Mr. Pasadena. Question. So you're just, for the sake of summarizing, so that I can clearly understand it, Mr. Carter, stand it. Mr. Carter has three channels open through you, Mr. Pasadena, at Mr. Khomeini's behest. Meets with two people in Madrid, Mr. Hashimi and Mr. Pottinger. You believe that when Mr. Pasadena met with them, all they did was discuss negotiations on behalf of Mr. Reagan and not Mr. Carter. Is that right? Answer, uh-huh. It appears that Pottinger wasn't really concerned for the best interests of the U.S. hostages being held at the Iranian embassy, but was instead playing a complex political game on behalf of his beloved Republican Party. And it shouldn't be a surprise. Reagan was running alongside Pottinger's good friend, George H.W. Bush. And as we have already seen in the case of Orlando Letier, Pottinger was willing to bend or break the rules to help Bush. Pottinger also still harbored some political ambition during this period and may have also coveted a position in the Reagan administration if he could help make this operation a success. When the 1993 October Surprise Task Force needed to understand and track the meetings which happened during July 1980, Stanley Pottinger was happy to supply them his telephone records and usually confidential attorney timesheets. Pottinger's client attorney confidentiality as far as Cyrus Hashimi was concerned was no longer an issue as by 1993, Hashimi had already died in London seven, seven years prior after becoming ill with a rare and virulent form of acute myoblastic leukemia, which had been diagnosed only two days before his death. Here we have an article. <clears throat> Pottinger appears in Newsday in a 1986 article examining his relationship to Hashimi and Epstein associate uh, Kashhagi. In fact, there was more than one secret rendezvous in Madrid during July and August of 1980 concerning the Iranian hostage crisis involving some of the biggest players of the era. Ari ben Menashe, the former Israeli intelligence operator, had testified to having knowledge of four meetings in Spain in 1980 between William Casey, who was Reagan's campaign manager at the time and who was later rewarded by becoming the head of the CIA in January 1981, and Mehdi Karoubi, an Islamic Republican Party bigwig, Ben Mashi, went on to state that three of the meetings took place in Madrid and the last of them was held in Barcelona. Of those meetings, the first two were said to have taken place between February and May, with the third one at the end of July and the final meeting in August. The claim that William Casey went to Madrid at the end of July was disputed afterwards, as mentioned in Whitney Webb's One Nation Under Blackmail, Volume 1, which states, according to Jamshid, Casey flanked by Donald Gregg and, and an unidentified man, attended two days of meetings with himself, his brother Cyrus, and Iranian officials in Madrid in late July concerning the hostages. Much of the debate 
relating to the October Surprise Task Force revolved around Casey having been in London for a World War II historical conference on the days when he was alleged to have been in Madrid. The task force noted that there were significant ambiguities in the conference attendance records, making it harder to know whether Casey could be uh, consistently accounted for in London. Madrid is only half an hour and half from London by plane. Conceivably giving Casey enough time to move between the cities in a relatively insignificant amount of time. While the media soundly rejected the possibility that this occurred, a State Department cable letter emerged from this precise time period stating that Casey had indeed been in Madrid for purposes unknown. Webb also points out that there were more than just one Reagan campaign grandee stand staying in the same hotel as Jamshid, stating, there was, quote, there was another name that appeared in the guest records right alongside the probable aliases of Jamshid Hashimi. On the 23rd of July, a Robert Gray checked into the Hotel Ritz, and on July 25th, he checked out. Was Robert Gray actually Robert Keith Gray? Speculation swirled in the media as Gray, at the time, was working on Reagan's campaign directly under Casey. By the 18th of September, Saunders advised the Iran, Iran Working Group that Pottinger had contacted him to advise him that Cyrus Hashimi had been offered a special position by Raf Sanjani, the Speaker of the Majid, Majlis, Majlis, who wanted him to be one of the two advisors to the special parliamentary commission, which were considering the hostage crisis. A week later, Saunders again reported on Pottinger and Hashimi, saying that they were trying to work with work Hashimi back into the negotiation process by offering to track Shah's assets. However, Cyrus Hashimi was also committing other more serious actions behind the scenes. In September of 1980, the U.S. government received information from one of Hashimi's former employees that they were actually helping the Khomeini regime to circumvent the United States arms embargo and sanctions which had been leveled against Iran. In, that information came alongside an accusation that the Hashimis were circulating pro Khomeini propaganda in the U.S. Saunders again brought in the CIA. By early October 1980, the CIA had uncovered substantial information concerning the business dealings of the Hashimis. In the same year as Pottinger had helped to manufacture the October surprise, and by doing so, helped to subvert the U.S. democratic process, he was also defending Gerald Bull. Bull had similarly broken an, another arms embargo by selling weapons to South Africa, and you may imagine that Pottinger had the good sense to reject this later proposal by Hashimi. However, on the 10th of December, 1980, Pottinger organized with Cyrus Hashimi and his brother, Reza Hashimi, to ship arms through a Netherlands Antilles trading company and to list the destination to a firm in Switzerland. The meetings took place in Hashimi's New York office, which was being secretly kept under surveillance by law enforcement. But Cyrus Hashimi and Stanley Pottinger were not the only people involved in the U.S.-Iran arms deals during this period. In fact, two very close associates of Cyrus Hashimi were also involved in the conspiracy to run arms as part of the Iran-Contra Iran affair. The so-called Saudi Arabian businessman Adnan 
Kasagi and an Iranian called Manucher Gorbanifar were also employed as conduits for the U.S. sanctioned arms sales to Iran. In fact, at the same time that Adnan Kashagi was working with the National Security Council as a middleman for these illegal arms deals, a government informant, along with federal agents, were involved in a sting operation targeting the Saudi. On the 21st of December, 1986, Robert E. Kessler wrote an article for Newsday, which reported this failed operation to ensnare Adnan Kashagi. Kashagi. Quote, the unsuccessful attempt to ensnare Kashagi, which is mentioned in a conversation between Hashimi and a former lawyer for Kashagi, that was recorded by U.S. Customs Service agents on January 17, 1986, seems bizarre enough in retrospect. Obviously, they weren't told everything that was going on, end quote, said a ranking Justice Department official, referring to the agents and federal prosecutors who were working on the sting. The Kessler article also alludes to Pottinger's role in the affair, stating, the story includes a 1980 offer to free the U.S. hostages in Iran that backfired, an investigation by the FBI and the Customs Service of a former Justice Department official who had been instrumental in investigating FBI agents for misconduct, the disappearance of a key wiretap tape, the recent uh, demotion of the federal agent who lost the tape and the death of Hashimi in what some defense attorneys say were mysterious circumstances. Kessler reveals that the secretive foreign intelligence service based in Washington had authorized the 1980 wiretaps, which originally drew officials to the involvement of Pottinger himself. The wiretap had been placed on his telephones at the investment bank which Cirrus Hashimi owned, First Gulf Bank and Trust at 9 West 57th Street, and revealed that Hashimi had eventually become a government informant to avoid prosecution. Hashimi and Kashagi had worked together before their joint arms smuggling ventures. The aforementioned Newsday article also notes that, quote, he, Hashimi, had been, had represented the Iranian state oil company in London and had been a partner of Kashagi's and Fermark's in an unsuccessful attempt early in 1985 to supply arms and other goods to Iran. But Hashimi and Kashagi split before Kashagi went on to serve as a middleman in the U.S. sanctioned arms deal. Some sources said Hash Hashimi also knew Gorbanifar, who, whom he introduced to Kashagi. End quote. Even though the article initially only alludes to a former Justice Department official's involvement in the affair, Kessler eventually names Pottinger. The article reads, when Pottinger was in the Justice Department, he was instrumental in seeking to indict about 60 FBI agents for illegal break-ins at the homes of friends and relatives of alleged members of the Weather Underground in the New York area. He also was the boyfriend of feminist Gloria Steinem. Cases were eventually brought uh, against only two ranking FBI officials in connection with the break-ins. The two were tied, tried, and convicted, but were pardoned by President Ronald Reagan in 1980. Uh, sources familiar with Pottinger's role said he was not only Hashimi's lawyer, but also a business associate, having invested $100,000 in a merchant bank Hashimi was starting in London. While J. Stanley Pottinger was representing Cyrus Hashimi in 1980, Adnan Kashagi 
was also being taken on as a client by other big players with strong intelligence agency connections. As reported in Whitney Webb's One Nation Under Blackmail, quote, Cohen and Gray reportedly knew each other, but the exact nature of the relationship is difficult to discern. They were, however, most certainly intimately acquainted during Ronald Reagan's 1980 presidential campaign, when both men worked closely with William Casey, who was the campaign manage, campaign's manager and subsequently Reagan's CIA director. Shortly after the campaign, Cohen Gray and Jeffrey Epstein would all take on arms dealer Adnan Khashoggi as a client at the dawn of the Iran-Contra affair. In fact, J. Stanley Pot uh, end quote. In fact, J. Stanley Pottinger, one of the lead lawyers now representing many of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, organized a significant part of the Iran-Contra affair and benefited from the illegal sales of weapons alongside Cyrus Hashami, Adnan Khashoggi, and Jeffrey Epstein himself. It is also during this period which Stanley Pottinger later admits first working with Jeffrey Epstein, but that will be covered in the third part of this series. I think this is the third part, maybe the fourth part. <clears throat> Uh, by 1980, J. Stanley Pottinger had clearly become a high-level intelligence operative working in partnership with the CIA, dealing with some of the most sensitive issues of the day. But Stanley Pottinger wasn't only living like James Bond, professionally speaking. He even had his own pussy galore. In 1970... Uh, sorry, in 1974, while Pottinger was responsible for the official investigations into the FBI's illegal surveillance and harassment of Martin Luther King Jr., as well as the Kent State Massacre, he reached out to one of the leading feminist voices of the era, as well as the investigations into the potential, potential state-sponsored murder. Pottinger was also responsible for sexual discrimination charges, which is how we met. Uh, Gloria Steinem told Newsday's David Barrams in the 12th of March, 1979 edition of the Boston Globe in a piece entitled Steinem at 45 on life, love, self. However, there is much Gloria Steinem hasn't told anyone before, and this investigation will not only look at the more widely reported links Pottinger's long-term girlfriend had to the CIA, but also we'll look at it. Another event which happened while Gloria Steinem was being recruited by the Central Intelligence Agency in 1958, which has been almost completely wiped from history. How the man disguised himself as a feminist icon. Steinem had been born to Leo and Ruth Steinem and from the age of 10 until 17 years old, she was brought up in Toledo, Ohio. Her father ran a resort in Michigan during the summer months and was described by Gloria herself as in show business of a sort. Eventually, Steinem's high grades saw her win a scholarship to Smith College, where she received her Bachelor of Arts degree in May of 1956. It is here where there are notable discrepancies in the official narrative. It was widely reported that Gloria Steinem had been awarded the Chester Bowles Scholarship on graduating from Smith College, which was a two-year scholarship to travel around India beginning in 1956. Steinem seemed to be where the action was wherever she roamed during these years including riots in Ramand and revolution in Rangoon, but she also famously befriended India, uh, Indra, Indira Gandhi 
and the widow of the revolutionary humanist. Uh, Narada, Narenda Nath Roy. It is also during this time that Gloria Steinem appears to have been surreptitiously recruited to the CIA via an agent she met in Delhi named Clive S. Gray, who we'll talk about shortly. After her tour of India ended, Steinem was to be instrumental in organizing an anti-communist operation at the festival in Vienna for the CIA. However, during the brief period of time between Steinem being recruited by the CIA in India and organizing the CIA-led effort in Austria, there is another much more sinister and little reported event which the freshly recruited CIA operative Gloria Steinem was involved with. That event saw Steinem become a key witness and narrative setter in the very suspicious and mysterious death of a high-ranking U.S. Navy officer in the Pacific Ocean. On the 25th of July, 1958, the Daily Times newspaper of Ohio was one of the many outlets to run the syndicated news article on the very peculiar disappearance in a piece entitled Transferred Admiral Lost at Sea, Suicide Suspected. Rear Admiral Lynn C. Quiggle had been in the process of transferring from his post as Deputy Chief of Staff on the Joint Staff Command of U.S. Forces in Japan, where he had also been assigned as the U United States Forces Japan representative to the U.S.-Japan Joint Committee, which had been set up under an administrative agreement between the two countries. And there we have his picture, huh? Rear Admiral Lynn C. Quiggle. Quiggle had been born, I'm sorry, Quiggle had been on board the President Cleveland, a steam passenger ship, which had originally been constructed for battle during World War II, but by completion in 1947 had been refitted to be a steamliner. The Cleveland had been taking Quiggle and his wife en route to his new base in San Diego, California, where he'd assumed command of an amphibious Group 1 of the Pacific Fleet. During World War II, he had served on the Iowa battleship when it was used to transport Franklin D. Roosevelt to an Allied conference in Tehran. With a prestigious career under his belt, Quiggle was seen as a veritable war hero. A few years before Quiggle's untimely demise, he had also been appointed the UN Military Armistice Commission in Seoul. Seoul. By the 24th of July, 1958, it was being reported that Lynn Quiggle had probably committed suicide by jumping overboard around 800 miles off the U.S. coast. Remarkably, in two of the syndicated news reports, which were published across America following Quiggle's death, Gloria Steinem is quoted as a key witness. In the aforementioned Daily Times article, it states, quote, Fellow passengers said Quiggle had been acting peculiarly. One Gloria Steinem, 24 of Washington, D.C., said a ship officer told her Quiggle was heard to say to his wife, you are better off as a widow. The admiral then kissed his wife and walked slowly from their stateroom, Miss Steinem said. End quote. The quote from Gloria Steinem wrapped a proverbial bow over the suicide theory, although his family later argued that suicide was very unlikely. In fact, on the 8th of August, 1958, Rear Admiral Lynn C. Quiggle's brother was reported as stating that there was no justification for calling it a case of suicide. At the time of Quiggle's disappearance, the man in charge of the President Cleveland, Commodore 
H.D. Emin had been quoted as saying there was no indication at all of any foul play, going on to say, quote, the last I could establish that anyone had seen him was a steward who had seen him go out on the deck from the lobby about 4.45 a.m. I felt very little could be accomplished by turning the ship about, end quote. Lynn Quiggle's supposed last words were repeated in various newspapers over the following weeks. Words first reported by Gloria Steinem, a 24-year-old student who was in the process of being recruited by the CIA. The Miami Herald also quoted Gloria Steinem in an article on the 25th of July, 1958. But on this occasion, the article gives more detail. Quote, Ms. Gloria Steinem, 24, of Washington, D.C., a student who became friendly with the Quiggles, said she was told by one of the ship's officers that Quiggle was heard to tell his wife, you are better off a widow. This was after midnight, Tuesday, she said. The officer told her the admiral then kissed his wife and walked slowly from their stateroom. Lynn Quiggle's wife was reported to be in a state of shock and unable to answer any questions, leaving Gloria Steinem, a fresh-faced, newly, newly recruited member of the CIA, to talk to the press and convey her husband's supposed final conversation to the world. What's most astonishing is that on 11th of August, 1958, about 18 days after the tragic disappearance of Lynn C. Quiggle, the Hanford Sentinel published an article entitled Disappearance of Rear Admiral from Aboard Ship, Still Mystery. And afterwards, there are no more mentions of Quiggle. It is almost as though the case was completely abandoned, with Doyle Quiggle, brother of the deceased, stating, The skipper classified it as a suicide, but he was in no position to know. The, the Navy Review Board, which began its investigation as soon as the ship docked, did not produce any evidence of suicide. Lynn Quiggle's brother argued vehemently against the theory that his sibling had committed suicide, stating there was nothing in his character to justify such a conclusion. Whatever the truth, an effective narrative had been created by Gloria Steinem's command, comments. Whether Quiggle's wife had actually reported his supposed last words or whether it was unreliable secondhand information from a globetrotting student who had been recently recruited by the CIA, the true circumstances surrounding Quiggle's death were never cleared up and the case soon vanished from the public eye. Steinem talks about this period of her life and eventually briefly mentions befriending the Quiggles in a book by Sidney Ledenstrong uh, Stern writes in 1997 entitled Gloria Steinem, Her Passions, Politics, and Mystique. The book states, quote, Gloria explains, not only did the crew speak English, they sneaked her above decks during the day so she could mingle with the more privileged passengers. Among them were Rear Admiral and Miss, Mrs. Quiggle, and when Admiral Quiggle disappeared en route, the tragedy was the talk of the ship, especially since one of the ship's officers had overheard the Admiral tell his wife he'd be better off a widow. When they docked, the captain forbade the crew to speak to the press about the incident, but Gloria had received no such instructions, so she tried to be helpful. She answered reporters' questions and was shocked to find herself quoted from Washington to Tokyo. Quote. In 1959, the so-called Independent Service for Information, ISI, was set up at Harvard, 
coincidentally while Pottinger was a student at the university. The program was created to target European youth attending the Vienna Youth Festival with anti-communist propaganda designed, supplied, and delivered secretly by the CIA. To achieve this goal, the agency required the participation of youth leaders who were well-traveled and capable of persuading young people that communism was the enemy. Steinem is even mentioned in Hugh Wilford, Will, Williford's, let's see, Wilford's critically important historical masterpiece, The Mighty Wurlitzer, which covers the creation of the CIA and much of its early leadership and development. In a chapter entitled Students, Wilford writes, quote, it was the fall of 1958, and like many educated young women of her generation, Gloria Steinem was having difficulty finding a rewarding job. Dazzlingly bright and talented, just returned from a year and a half long scholarship to India, where she had befriended Indra Gandhi and the widow of revolutionary humanist M. N. Roy, the 24 year old. Smith graduate was reduced to sleeping on the floors of friends' apartments as she hunted for work in New York. Then came a call from Clive S. Gray, a young man she had met in Delhi, where he was ostensibly working on a doctoral dissertation about the Indian higher education system. End quote. Steinem at Gray and another CIA agent called Harry Loon in New York to discuss the Vienna proposal. Loon had previously been a former Na National Student Association, NSA, president, and according to Wilford, fell in love with Steinem. Afterwards, Steinem was sent to Cambridge, Massachusetts to meet with Len Bebchik and Paul E. Sigmund, Jr both former NSA vice presidents for international affairs and who were accompanied at the meeting by a Boston lawyer named George Abrams. Again, in this point, NSA refers to National Student Association. In January of 1959, Gloria Steinem took up the post of Director of Independent Services for Information located on Harvard Yard. The CIA front organization supplied her with a handsome salary of $100 a week, equivalent to over $1,000 a week in today's currency, an extra $5 to help towards the expensive rents in Cambridge, as well as being paid a general allowance, which was to be decided by the infatuated Harry Loon. When discussing what the ISI wanted to achieve, Wilford goes on to write, the ISI was a CIA operation from the beginning to end. Spectacularly staged festivals celebrating the themes of international peace and friendship were a crucial element in the communist campaign to capture young hearts and minds. Witness the success of the 1951 Berlin rally, which had helped concentrate CIA minds on student affairs. The fact that the Vienna World Festival of Youth and Students was being planned personally by the new head of the KGB, former student leader Alexander uh, Sheljapin, was some measure of the the importance it was accorded in the Kremlin, <clears throat> end quote. Not only was it clear that ISI was a CIA operation, Steinem soon discovered this fact for herself after asking about the funding for the project with Williford writing, quote, Lund Sigmund and Bebchik were all working directly for the CIA when they organized the ISI. So too was Gray, whose real purpose in India was talent spotting potential agents in the student movement. 
As for Steinem herself, she became wittingly when she began to ask, began asking questions about ISI's funding and the undercover CIA officers explained that the Boston grandees and foundations apparently subsidizing the venture were in fact pass-throughs for secret official funds. Who is, who is J. Stanley Pottinger? By 1983, Steinem and Pottinger's relationship was almost a decade old, and they were still seen out together regularly. In December that year, the couple appeared on ABC's 2020 program, Dancing Together, with Steinem also showing off her tap dancing ability to the host, society favorite Barbara Walters. Even though Steinem was more open about her relationship with Pottinger, as the 1980s began, she had originally tried to keep her love life under wraps. In 1972, a couple of years before Pottinger and Steinem say the, they first met, she co-founded Ms. Magazine and became one of the most visible feminist leaders in the U.S. For her, Admitting she was dating a Nixon-era gray-suited company man was clearly not commit, not something she felt she needed to do. In fact, Gloria Steinem had constructed her image carefully in order to become an important and well-heard influencer targeting the young girls of America. In 1978, Steinem was living with Pottinger and finally opened up to the press about her longtime lover with the New York or with the Times Post news service reporting on the 10th of March 1979, quote, Pottinger, 39, former head of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division, is now in private practice specializing in civil rights cases. Quote, there are cases in which some principle is at stake, so there's some satisfaction, end quote, Steinem said. In the mid-1970s, Pottinger headed the department's probe into the FBI and Kent State crisis. He was also responsible for investigating sex discrimination charges, which is how we met, Steinem said. However much color Steinem applied in an attempt to paint Pottinger as a noble character, in reality, Pottinger's clients, after leaving his position in the Justice Department, included Chemical Bank, Mead, Gerald Bull, and the Space Research Corporation, SRC, not, only, not to mention the Hashimis, which led to his involvement in Iran-Contra. The claim that Pottinger was still working primarily on civil rights issues during this period was one of the many lies Steinem told to retain her own manipulated public image that had been manufactured by herself and the Central Intelligence Agency. Although many people looking on were wondering about the potential future wedding bells, it was also reported that Steinem herself was categorically in saying that the relationship would never lead to marriage. In 1982, Steinem and Pottinger were again reported mixing with the elites, in this time attending a party on the Queen Elizabeth II, the QE2, organized and hosted by Georgiana Bronfman and her husband, the chairman of Joseph E. Seagram and Sons Incorporated, Edgar M. Bronfman. Bronfman. The party saw over 1,000 of the richest and most powerful people gather to raise $108,000 in funds for the Wolf Trap Foundation and the Upward Fund. The Bronfmans had footed the bill for the gathering which cost $100,000, almost as much as the total funds raised. On that occasion, Pottinger and Steinem 
also brought a guest along, a New York Times article from the 18th of January, 1982, stated, avoiding the press, Mary Cunningham, now a Seagram vice president, came with William M. Agree, A.G., the chairman of Bendix, where Miss Cunningham once worked, Gloria Steinem in burgundy velvet and an Indian-style gold headband, chatted with George J. Green, the president of the New Yorker, both guests of J. Stanley Pottinger, a Washington civil rights lawyer. Steinem and Pottinger were together for a decade before Pottinger's involvement in the Iran-Contra affair started to emerge in 1984. In March that year, they were still noted as arriving at an event together, that event being the 50th birthday of Gloria Steinem, which took place in the grand ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria. But after the FBI publicly outed Pottinger as instrumental in the sale of illegal weapons during the Iran-Contra affair, Steinem and Pottinger's own affair soon comes to an end. Whether it was all of the attention stirred up by Pottinger's central role in the Iran-Contra scandal, or whether the decade-long relationship had just petered out naturally, Steinem and Pottinger were soon to find new lovers within the establishment, with Pottinger beginning a relationship with Kathy Lee Gifford and Steinem leaving Pottinger's embrace for that billionaire industrialist Mort Zuckerman. Uh, Pottinger, far right, alongside girlfriend Gloria Steinem, courtesy of the New York Times. Kathy Lee Gifford, who was still Kathy Lee Johnson when they began dating, was the ravishing co-host of WABC's TVC morning show alongside Regis Philbin. In a Daily News article dated the 29th of December 1985, her new relationship with Pottinger is discussed, stating, quote, she's got a date for sushi with the man in her life for the past year and a half, Stan Pottinger. She met Pottinger, 45, an assistant attorney general during the Nixon and Ford administrations when he was still involved with feminist Gloria Steinem. Um, he remembered saying to himself, I'll call her someday, reveals Johnson. I'm more in love right now than I've ever been, she says. He's the smartest man I've ever known, the funniest too. He's the first man I've been with who's completely secure in himself. Will they get married? Marriage scares us both, she confides. However, uh, end quote. However, in love, Kathy Lee Gifford was still with J. Stanley Pottinger. He was definitely not a man who was looking to settle down. By November 1992, Kathy Lee Gifford's career had been a success, and Pottinger was just a sad memory. Talking to the Daily News, Gifford, Gifford admitted how she began to lose her own religious identity during their relationship, saying, quote, I became one of the least religious people you'd ever meet because I understood religion in prisons people wants them to parrot the same slogans and conform. She tried sex outside marriage had, and, quote, had my teenage rebellion at age 30, and quote, but fell into destructive relationships with boyfriends like Gloria Steinem's ex Bo Stanley Pottinger, men who were emotionally unavailable. I was still in an emotional rut myself, but didn't have my self-esteem and dated men very similar to my first husband, she says. Quote, Stanley was a roller coaster, brought me to the heights of joy and the depths of despair, end quote. By 1984, the Iran-Contra affair had become public. Indictments followed, with five defendants named as part of the complicated case. Although Pottinger had been heavily involved in the illegal trade of arms with Iran, eventually 
he was only investigated and not indicted. On the 19th of July, 1984, the New York Times quoted then U.S. Attorney Rudolph W. Giuliani, quote, saying, quote, the investigation of Mr. Pottinger, Pottinger is continuing. It would be unfair to make judgment at this point, end quote. J. Stanley Pottinger should have been in an awful lot of trouble and even his own lawyer, T. Barry Kingham, stopped returning telephone calls for comment on the case, ignoring four from the New York Times alone. The public exposure of the Iran-Contra affair left Pottinger in a very tight spot. In fact, those who were reading the many news articles related to this breaking scandal during the mid-1980s weren't privy to all the information and it would be years before the events concerning the October surprise were put under anything close to public scrutiny. Regardless, as the news broke, uh, it now it was now public knowledge that the Potting, Pottinger had been central to the illegal sales of arms to the Iranians, yet he wasn't indicted. In reality, the Iran-Contra affair was a very complex series of events with many subversive individuals, uh, individual actions, which still remain unknown. To avoid potential criminal prosecution and the various difficult questions which were being asked, Pottinger moved to Mexico for a while, at least until the dust settled. If Pottinger's role in Iran-Contra and the October surprise were fully investigated during this period, this would have undoubtedly led to further questions about his role in creating the official narratives around Watergate, the assassination, assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., and the Kent State Massacre, not to mention his involvement in cases such as the standoff at Wounded Knee, Orlando Letier and his authorizing of the CIA's domestic surveillance of U.S. citizens, as well as the Nixonian desegregation policies in general, while Pottinger was the director of the Office for Civil Rights. J. Stanley Pottinger had gained public recognition throughout the 1970s, being the official face of an emerging and evolving section of the Justice Department. However, by the 1980s, Pottinger's public face had almost completely vanished, only to be replaced with the shadowy features of an intelligence asset. By March of 1989, the state newspaper of South Carolina were asking, who is Stanley Pottinger? But without being able to give any real answers, as the true face of J. Stanley Pottinger will not be found in the public archives. In the third installment of The Road to the Takedown of Jeffrey Epstein, we will explore Pottinger's life from the 1990 onwards. The coming article will present to you previously unreported information. I'm expecting various people involved with the case to be begin to fundamentally change parts of their stories as the information begins to be anticipated and revealed. The direction of this series is clear to those who have insider knowledge. At this point, anything could happen. Thanks for reading and please support my work. Your work gives me breath, wakes me up and helps me write. <clears throat> and let's get the, um, let's get that link. Um, where he would like, uh, how do I copy this link? I'll just click it. And that's at uh, newspaste.com slash home slash support newspaste. I'll put that in the chat room. Share this tab instead. Let's 
So it looks like this. And uh, he, he, he does the patron thing. So you can support him that way or using uh, PayPal to support his work. And I'll give you, uh, uh, send him a cup of coffee, huh? <laughs> I can put this on the screen, I think, here. Create a QR code. And uh, that doesn't show up. I don't know why. Hmm. I don't think I can share this for some reason. I want to. But anyway, uh, back to here, the title screen of the show. Uh, we have a QR code that will get you to uh, his story. And then you can, toward the bottom of it, you can find the, uh, the link to support uh, his work. Um, this has been a fascinating read. I'm very, uh, very, very happy uh, to be able to uh, help get this information out there. Um, the my thoughts on the whole pedophilia type of thing is that uh, I think what we're we're starting to knit together is. Um, we heard in the other the, the earlier uh, article that I read in the past uh, where it had a vertical format to it and uh, that the Pottinger's uh, family seemed to have this uh, uh, babysitter and this, this idea of taking her um, outside of state borders onto a sailing vessel, a sailboat. And, uh, and you know, you, you can, uh, we can fill in the gaps with our imagination that she was, you know, that this is the pattern of how um, minors are used for uh, prostitution. And uh, I mean, it's it's a much larger thing than prostitution. I mean, we, we call it pedophilia, but uh, we're talking about uh, state level actors, people who uh, who have very very important roles to play in government, and and then uh, you know this naval admiral going missing. Um, I don't know if he was a naval admiral, but uh, he was a high-level naval person. And uh, you know, this is this is smelling very fishy. <laughs> not to uh, not, not to make too much of a pun of that. Um. Anyway, uh, I, I have some of my own ideas about what we can do. Um, to disarm this sort of behavior in the future. And uh, it has to go with the ideas I do with forgiveness-based economics. That is to say that we create, every time we're damaged, uh, a financial instrument worth the value of uh, the forgiveness of, of the uh, harmful act. And we, we put that price tag on it. It's a stated value instrument. And uh, we know that these are difficult to transact with in the present economy. But I'm looking to build uh, an economy of, uh, of people who will uh, engage these assets at their face value in a limited way. In other words, you create a cryptocurrency with say a million shares that is based on a particular uh, harmful acts forgiveness. And uh, the way we engage it at face value in a limited way is to just transact small amounts of it, like say 25 cents worth of the face value of that asset. Um, this can be done 
and it is a it is a slow uh and a, a but a building way of establishing a track record of uh transactions and value um that will be able to grow in the future you know instead of dealing with 25 cents worth you know it's it's a larger amount and at some point we move, we step up to merging financial instruments based on forgiveness with cash purchases uh, where you pay 99% with cash and 1% with this, uh, you know, forgiveness based instrument. Uh, the, you know, this being a part of a larger transaction uh, reifies the value of this. We're just not going to be able to see people getting remedy in this world for the, you know, uh, the infinite amount of wrongs done to people in this world. Um, you know, you can't be in a civilization if there's no remedy for the wrongs that are done to the people. And uh, <clears throat> that's why one of my projects is called Remedy Coin, remedycoin.com, R E M E D Y C O I N. And another is antimoney.net, A N T I M O N E Y.net. Um, we can start creating a new inheritance for every individual on earth um, by instantiating that out of, uh, for, you know, forgiveness. And uh, I was commenting to uh, Jenny McCarthy in a Twitter tweet today, trying to get her attention on this project. And I say that this is a, a way to do forgiveness with a vengeance you can have vengeful forgiveness in that you know in order to get even with what was done to you you create a forgiveness note of the value of just how immense the uh, the damages were and you're issuing the money yourself as a as a victim um, but uh, but then you create a financial instrument that shames um, the wrongdoer. It shames the uh, the deed of the wrongdoer, for the most part, and and actually ends up putting the wrongdoer back into um, good standing, uh, back into uh, what do we say? When someone's in, um, I can't, it, the word's just not coming to me right now. But anyway, I, I have an incident that happened to me in Bakersfield, California. Back in 2009, uh, September 28th, I believe, at uh, 3 a.m., uh, you know, the, the police pulled me over, falsely arresting me, hadn't done anything wrong. And uh, uh, they end up clubbing me 15 times, um, after which I, uh, I tipped over the officer who was so club happy. And, and then, um, then he threatened to suicide me with his own gun, uh, saying, I think he shot himself, and then stomped on my head three times. This was just the beginning of my uh, hospitality stay with the Bakersfield police and Kern County uh, court systems. And uh, in, in, in all that they did, it wasn't until many years later that I realized that they made me forget about buying Bitcoin, that the, the head injuries that I sustained uh, specifically made me miss entering Bitcoin at a time when the price was four Bitcoins for a penny. Now, they owe me that entry point multiplied times the damages for all the things that they did to me. So this becomes a, a huge thing. It's about 1.8 quintillion dollars of damage that I can forgive. And I can create this asset 
Um, and then, you know, my idea about, well, how do I ever, you know, get that money to mean anything to anyone is to split it up among 8 billion people on earth and give each person their inheritance. I think the, uh, you know, it's something like uh, $20 million for every one of 8 million people, 8 billion people on the, on earth. So um, that should blow your mind. And uh, this show is a broadcast of forgivenesscapital.com where we believe in the infinite worth of every human being. Um, even the, the, the ones who behave so badly. Um, so uh, there we go. Those are some ideas. I'm very concerned about the the tidal wave that's coming of uh, the um, you know the pendulum swings one way and then the other way, and and people get all worked up and they want to uh, you know go to war against this pedophilia thing, and I want to suggest that we we find a way to. Um, to monetize this, to use the alchemical ability of forgiveness. And we can not only resolve these problems, um, we make it, we make pedophilia less of a, um, a money-making scheme for those who want to peddle power. Um, um, <clears throat> And it be, it becomes less, I think, somewhat less traumatic. Um, no, I mean, there's there's a lot of trauma. There's ways to treat it. I do tuning fork work on people to uh, treat their um, sexual traumas and emotional traumas of various kinds. Um, it's not. It doesn't. It's not a whole. You know, it doesn't solve the whole problem or whatever. But it. It does make significant inroads and allows people to continue in their uh, healing journey. So please contact me if you uh, if you know uh, if you'd like to experience that. We have some shows already uh, put up uh, that that give you a taste of what that kind of treatment is like, and it's uh, free of. of charge here we go the the website of this show is at remedycoin.com slash remedy report and uh you'll see a whole list of things there there's a uh, um so you know sexual uh trauma um there's there's our shows that deal with the uh the pelvis and uh, you know many many different parts of the body and we work on the timeline using the tuning fork and the, uh, the acoustical sound uh, that, that it makes. And it helps to, uh, the, the coherent signal of the tuning fork helps to clear um, clear up the, uh, the dissonant, chaotic energies that have been embedded in the timeline of your, uh, your human biofield. It's kind of what it sounds like that up there by the microphone. And if that feels a little too strong for you, uh, you know, there are, there are uh, methods I can use to, to subdue that and make it more palatable for you. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, I hope that you subscribe. And if you uh, know some people you want to share this with, that'd be great. Um, I'm also working on a, uh, some consulting in terms of uh, people's health uh, and nutrition and so forth like that. Um, got some really different uh, ideas in that. I'm, I'm following the work of uh, Dr. Garrett Smith and Grant Jenneru, uh, where they're exposing how vitamin A is not a vitamin at all. 
in fact, it's a toxin and it's causing all manner of sickness and disease. Um, and I think there's something coupled in the, uh, the biofield tuning and the vitamin A toxicity. Because some people can take, they can eat liver and they can, you know, uh, eat fish oil and all, all these kinds of things that vitamin A and toxic bile theory would normally say, stay away from these. And there's some people who've lived a long time and continue to, to, to do that. And I suspect that it has to do with traumas in their, uh, their human biofield that uh, are somehow inhibiting the proper excretion of some of these uh, toxins from their liver. So I'm doing a lot of uh, experimentation to bring remedy to the world. Um, my name is Joseph William Baker. That's a registered uh, trade, uh, a registered service mark with the U.S. Patent and Trade Office. We got somebody saying hi up there. WW86. <laughs> hi. Hi back at you. Uh, the show is about bringing harmony to the world through economic innovations, health tips, and increased awareness. And uh, I like to say that the show is for entertainment purposes only. Wink. And that is there to keep the, uh, the sensors off our back. <clears throat> While still uh, speaking our mind about things. Thank you so much. We'll we'll talk again soon. Goodbye for now. Oh yeah, there is one more thing I'd like to say here. Um And how do we do that? We'll we'll, we'll continue with this the um, there's been experiences in Bakersfield, California in the past where the district attorney was, was getting all these people and getting them uh, prosecuted for doing uh, child molestation of their own children. And, uh, you know, this sounds horrific. It sounds like uh, the whole pedophilia type of thing. But this is, a, this is an example of how um, some of these large population wielding, uh, political moves happen. And, uh, it's like, you know, people get a vengeance in them and they move toward these things in a way where they're, um, you know, they just want to use the, the power of government, the violent power of government to correct injustices done to people, perceived injustices. Well, these numerous uh, of these uh, these cases, there was no none of this uh, this stuff going on about the parents with pedophilia actions against their children. It was all a big ruse. There were prosecutors who were questioning the children in ways that were improper, where they were asking leading questions and they they got these children to testify on the stand um simply through exhausting the children by you know continuing to ask them these questions until they got the answers that they wanted from the children so um um i sense that this is happening around the corner and that we're about to have a huge backlash, that's the word I was looking for before, a huge backlash against um, the powers that have that have taken taken the throne, uh, even uh, President Biden himself, a, a pedophile who, uh, according to his daughter's uh, book, uh, he was taking showers with her and t touching her inappropriately. Um, so we've got that kind of uh, evidence, and, and I've talked about that on my show, uh, you know, uh, well, just before the uh, uh, Joe Biden um, 
before the election, the supposed election. Anyway, so these are these are uh, very concerning things. They do uh, pedophilia does need to stop, um, and I I have to I have to really start to question these organizations like the Scottish Rite and uh, the Masons and such. Um, these are the places where I think you know sex magic is going on this type of thing. And, uh, and that, uh, you know, people are, are selling um, the abuse of their own children uh, to people who are, you know, performing some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, magical thing. I mean, I've heard of that, uh, that they use this to protect, uh, the, like the person who does the, the sexual act against a child has a certain kind of protection um, um, a, a demonic sort of protection or something that they acquire from the act activity. Um, I feel that using these tuning forks and clearing the sexual trauma of the child might have the effect of breaking the spell of the of the uh, protection on the on the, the wrongdoers. So uh, anyway, if people would like to do those types of things, I've got lots of ideas on how to kind of undo some of these things, and uh, you know, I'm looking for people who'd like to to work on that. And this can make uh, these things more. Uh, easier to talk about uh, without even, I mean, we, it's not like we have to relive these kind of ideas. We don't have to talk about it. Uh, it's a simple st strategy of playing a tuning fork and using specific geometries and distances. And uh, we're aiming at places in the timeline of your life. You just kind of feel a little tingle um, at the worst you might start crying and, uh, and, and that would be, uh, you know, about 10 or 15 minutes of, of intense um, sobbing or whatever. And uh, you don't really understand what you're crying about, but it uh, it's your subconscious, you know, bringing some finality and, and, and serious uh, processing to that whole ordeal. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. We'll we'll be uh, talking later. Thank you. Goodbye.